Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me warmly welcome you to this joint event of the Center for Financial Studies, the Research Center SAFE, and the Deutsche Bundesbank. I'm delighted that our invitation has attracted such a large response, and this can be credited above all to today's speaker, Mr. Jim Yong Kim, the president of the World Bank Group. And it is a great honor and pleasure to have you here, Jim. We owe the privilege of your pre yeah. <laughs> I think we owe the privilege of your presence here today to the G7 summit in Schloss Elmau, which has just come to a close. What's more, I also had the opportunity to get a sneak preview of your views and priorities recently in Dresden when the meeting of the G7 finance ministers and central bank governors took place. This means that you are in a unique position to report directly to us on the summit and also on the extent to which this meeting format is really able to advance important geopolitical but also development issues. It was actually at another G meeting that the idea of this speech was born when the two of us met very recently at the G20 meeting and at the spring meeting of the IMF and the World Bank Group this year in Washington, you immediately agreed to come to Frankfurt. Thank you very much for that. And we are all proud to be hosting the head of the leading international development institution here today. With its global membership of 188 countries, its huge and perhaps partly untapped financial and technical resources and its outstanding expertise, the World Bank is in a unique position to promote the economic development of emerging and developing countries. President, Kim, President Kim's regular participation in the G20 discussions and his recent attendance to the G7 summit in Schloss Elmau clearly demonstrate the World Bank's key role within the scope of international economic cooperation. And 2015, is a crucial year for development. Heads of state will come together on several occasions over the coming months to renew and advance the global development agenda. This agenda will shape the face of international economic cooperation over the next 15 years. The World Bank Group, the regional development banks, and the IMF are critical partners in the world's collective ability to deliver on the aspirations behind these processes. Under the leadership of President Kim, the World Bank has committed itself to working towards two strategic goals, ending poverty worldwide by 2030 and promoting shared prosperity. These goals are at the heart of the global agenda and we all hope to learn more from you about what it will take to achieve these goals. In all of the meetings we've jointly attended most recently in Dresden, where Jim called for the creation of a pandemic emergency facility, he has impressed me with his calm and convincing way in which he makes his points. And you might argue that this does not come as a surprise, since as a former physician, he knows his subject very well. In a nutshell, there are many, pressi many pressing topics that President Kim may address today. And I look forward to listening to his lecture and the Q&A following it. Before I give the floor to you, Jim, the president of the Center for Financial Studies, Otmar Issing, would also like to welcome you and introduce you to our audience. Thank you very much and welcome again. Dear President Kim, dear President Weidmann, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you here at our wonderful campus. And we are proud that you are giving this lecture uh, to a Frankfurt audience. The Research Center SAFE is a cooperation of the Center for Financial Studies and Goethe University, founded in 2013. Not Goethe University, but SAFE. 
the acronym SAFE stands for Sustainable Architecture for Finance in Europe. Uh, we bring together researchers from a variety of disciplines that undertake fundamental research in areas related to financial institutions, financial markets, financial well-being of households and firms, and questions of rules and regulation for a stable financial architecture. Besides conducting fundamental research, SAFE offers research-based policy advice to governments and institutions involved with financial market policy. At CFS and SAFE, we believe that stable and efficient financial markets are crucial for growth, political stability, and global development opportunities. The topical focus of our research institutions therefore possesses a direct link to the topic of today's talk, namely how the fate of developing countries is related to the global economic environment. Uh, before giving the floor to President Kim. Uh, President Kim is ready after his presentation to take questions, uh, which uh, we will organize here. And uh, now we are looking forward to your speech on <clears throat> tackling three intractable challenges facing the world. Uh, we are looking forward to your speech. Thank you so much. Thank you. Vielen Dank für Ihre freundliche Begrüßung. Ich spreche ein bisschen Deutsch. Ich habe Deutsch im Gymnasium gelernt. But unfortunately not gelernt very well, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll continue here in, in English. It's a... Um, it's a tremendous honor for me to be here at uh, Goethe University in Frankfurt, especially at the invitation of my friend uh, Jens Weidemann. You know, one of the things that I really want all of you to know and all German citizens to know uh, is that uh, if there's one lesson that I've learned in three years as president of the World Bank Group, it's that leadership matters. And you have an outstanding leader, of course, in Chancellor Merkel, one of the people I admire most, but I, I, I think you really all should appreciate uh, having someone like Jens as a central bank governor. Uh, when he speaks during our meeting, you know, we meet at least five times a year, Jens. We meet at the G7, the G20. We meet at the annual meetings, the spring meetings. And I can tell you that whenever he speaks, people are on the edge of their chair listening uh, to what he might say. And to have leadership like that, I think it makes uh, Germany very, very fortunate and the prospects are, uh, for the future are very bright. And I want to thank Jens. <laughs> you know, I, I was a university president at one time, so I really love being back uh, in, uh, in the classroom, uh, a little bit bigger classroom, but I love being in the classroom. And, and especially uh, the uh, university named after a man whose ideas were not only rich, but seem to span every area of endeavor. There's a particular, medical students, if there are any in the room, there's a particular part of your cheekbone that was discovered by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Uh, and he said, and this is a saying that I repeat all the time, this is a saying that many people in the world uh, who are trying to make things better repeat over and over and over again. Knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. At the World Bank Group, at the most fundamental level, we share this commitment. Our goal is to apply the world's best ideas, knowledge, and experience in development to accomplish uh, what Jens has described as our twin goals. The first is to end extreme poverty by 2030, and I'll be specific about that later if, uh, if you want this, the actual statistics, and to boost shared prosperity, meaning boost the incomes of the bottom 40%, the bottom two quintiles of any developing country and ensure that their incomes grow faster than the overall growth of the economy. Uh, the cutoff for extreme poverty is $1.25 a day. And uh, although many people might think that that's, uh, that's a very low goal, there's still a billion people living on less than $1.25 a day. 
Today, I want to uh, address what many people will see as three intractable challenges in the world. But we at the World Bank Group uh, believe that these challenges can be tackled and even vanquished. Uh, I'll have a few reflections on the G7 meetings that just en ended uh, and on a chance that Merkel's leadership in bringing together the world's leader, uh, leaders to face some of these extremely difficult problems. First, um, a little perspective on the World Bank's focus. We are focused uh, almost entirely on helping the poor and the vulnerable in low and middle income countries. And, and I think, as we all know, the developing countries have been an increasingly important engine in the global economy. Uh, over the last 10 years, roughly one third of the world's economic expansion has come from one country, that's China. Another third, roughly, has come from all the other developing countries combined, and the last third of global growth in the last decade has come from all the developed countries, including Germany. Taken together, excuse me, I'm going to move this out of the way. Here. Taken together, sorry, right? Taken together, the developing countries, can you hear me now? No, okay, so what if I get Better? Okay, good. Taken together, the developing countries accounted for 20% of the global GDP in the year 2000. In 2013, their share of global economic activity increased to 40%, a doubling in just 13 years. Low, middle, and emerging countries' share of world exports rose from 25% in 2000 to 40% in 2013. And for advanced economies like Germany, France, Japan, and the United States, the developing countries have become a key source of growth. Their share of advanced economies' exports was 20% in 2000, and it rose to 34% in 2013. For Germany, the third largest export market is China, with $83 billion worth of exports sent last year, behind only France and the United States. China has become a bigger export market for Germany than the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, or Italy. Now, while long-term projections involve a measure of speculation, the demographic trends and patterns of capital accumulation and productivity growth suggest that developing countries' future role in the economy will only increase. In 2011, for example, we proposed a 15-year baseline growth scenario that estimated that, developing, uh, uh, that emerging economies would grow at more than twice the rate of advanced economies. We thought that the overall average would be 4.7%, in, in the emerging economies and 2.3% in the developed world. And so far, we've been fairly accurate. Between 2011 and 2014, uh, emerging economies grew at 4.5% and uh, developed, uh, the advanced economies grew at 2.5%. In aggregate, this data means that economic growth in developing countries matters not only for poverty reduction in those countries, but for growth uh, overall in the world, especially going forward. Now, despite uh, these relatively bright prospects that I've just presented, economic growth in virtually all developing regions has slowed, especially among some of the group's largest middle-income countries. There's some notable bright spots. Uh, we could talk about that later if you'd like. Uh, India could see accelerated growth, and for the first time in 15 years, their growth rate could outpace China's. Um, excluding the BRIC countries, though, if you take the BRIC countries out, Overall, we expect that the uh, developing countries will grow at about 4.6%. Now, to emerge from this period of relatively slow growth, uh, developing countries will have to manage macroeconomic risks. For example, the outcome of negotiations between Greece, which of course we're all following, and its creditors will likely have spillover effects beyond the borders of the Euro area. We're, we're uh, watching especially carefully countries that we work with directly that, are in, that have direct connections in, uh, in Eastern Europe. We don't know what the impact will be. None of us knows what the impact will be. Uh, but in, the, in that particular context, we think that there are four major uh, uh, risks that um, especially developing countries face. The first is currency risk. Uh, second is interest rate risk. Uh, the third is the decline in global oil prices. And, and the four is the, is, is the more balanced but certainly slower growth uh, in China. Uh, in the euro area, the post-crisis recovery has been slow. The region's aggregate GDP approached its pre-crisis level only recently. 
Uh, while employment, unemployment is declining at 12.7 percent, it's still three percentage points higher than in September 2008. Progress within the euro areas also vary. Germany, Spain, France, and the Netherlands have experienced upward trends in growth, while countries like Austria and Finland have seen much weaker outcomes. By contrast, the recovery in the United States is well advanced. GDP is now almost 9% higher than before the crisis. Unemployment at 5.5% is lower than before the crisis. Uh, as a result, while the euro area and Japan are engaged in unprecedented exercises of quantitative easing that we know about, the United States has withdrawn uh, extraordinary measures, the bond buying program, and are preparing to tighten uh, which is uh, monetary policy, which is extremely loose still, uh, and they're going to proceed, they tell us very cautiously. So what happens with these resulting currency movements uh, are affecting growth. Uh, these currency movements are affecting growth in developing countries. And it's through two principal channels, a reevaluation effects on external debt stock and, of course, trade. Changing monetary policy is also going to drive an, in, uh, an increase in the U.S. federal funds rate, which may reverse the unprecedented uh, capital flows into developing countries that we've seen over the last few years. Since 2008, portfolio flows to low-income and emerging market countries have more than doubled, and within those portfolio uh, flows, bond flows have been particularly sizable. The average annual issuance over the last five years has been about $250 billion, that's each year, and that's three times higher on average than the immediately preceding seven years. Also, not surprisingly, uh, the recent decline in oil prices will have a negative impact on growth for all uh, uh, oil exporters, and that has had an impact that's been deeper and longer lasting uh, than we'd expected. Uh, overall, the approximately 50% decline that we saw from last year uh, could mean that oil importers will pay up to um, $750 billion less this year for oil compared to last year. And again, uh, we were hoping for a bump uh, in, in growth as a result of the lower oil prices, but we're still not quite seeing it. Uh, as for China and its slower growth, um, the, the, the country's more balanced economic development um, uh, strategy, which you know, they, they, they announced it four or five years ago, and uh, despite the fact that there are lower uh, growth rates, they've really stuck to a program that, that they've set out. And in fact, we do believe that the growth model is, uh, is becoming more sustainable. China's been an source, but for, for the developed, developing countries, China has been an incredibly important source of export demand. Uh, it's now the largest export destination for developing countries, whereas in 2000, just in 2000, it accounted for less than half a percent of exports from developing countries. Uh, the, 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 uh, the rate of China's growth, which is projected to be around 7% over the next three years, after three decades of close to double-digit uh, expansion, uh, will have an impact. Now, um, uh, our sense is that there are cycles to, to growth and that uh, um, uh, this, the, the previous period of uh, perhaps economic overheating uh, may be followed by a correction, but then stability. This is what we hope for. Um, all of these risks and all of these uh, 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 potential downsides for the developing world uh, lead me to uh, begin to talk about the three biggest problems that keep me awake at night. The first is this goal that we've set of ending extreme poverty by 2030. Uh, we, the, we really did the work. We did the calculations. We don't think that you can get extreme poverty below 3%. There's something that uh, our economists call frictional poverty, natural disasters, hurricanes, storms. Uh, there, there are so many natural disasters in the world that will plunge people even temporarily into poverty that we, can't, we don't think we can do much better than 3%. Uh, so 3% uh, from where we are right now is going to be extremely difficult. If we project backwards and look at the economic growth in developing countries over the last 20 years and then project forward that same rate of growth, which was high, over the next 15 years, we get to about 8%. So we have a lot of work to get it down below 3%. The second uh, uh, problem that keeps me awake at night is uh, preparing for the next pandemic. And what we've learned from Ebola, of course, is that we're wholly unprepared for a truly serious pandemic. Uh, the third is climate change. 
Uh, and climate change is one that I think everyone here is very much uh, aware of. Uh, but I have uh, two young children, a, four, a 15 year old now and a six year old. And I think about them and I think particularly about what they're gonna ask me in about 15 years if we're already at two degrees Celsius. And I know based on the way my children already talk to me, they're gonna say, Dad, what on earth were you doing? You were president of the World Bank. You knew this was coming. Why didn't you do more? So in tackling these problems, the argument I want to make today is that finance is key, and it may be the key to tackling problems of poverty, problems of the pandemic response, and problems of climate change. And not everyone sees it that way, but uh, let me make the argument to you. First of all, ending extreme poverty. Now, uh, we have a process called the Sustainable Development Goal Process, and we're in the middle of huge discussions on it. Right now, there are 17 uh, goals and 169 targets, a huge variety of, uh, of uh, uh, goals that are trying to solve just about every problem you can think of in the world. Um, some of these goals are very focused. Others read more like poetry, you know, things, the, the world as we want it to be. But anyway, when you have that many goals and targets, the bill for those, that many goals or targets is huge, and it's no longer gonna be covered with billions of dollars. We'll need trillions of dollars. And so one of the things that we've done is we've got all the multilateral development banks, uh, Asian Development Bank, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, European Investment Bank, uh, African Development Bank, all of us, we work together all the time. But we got together and we said, if we're gonna get from billions to trillions, we have to completely change the way we think about available finance for development. So we went back and we started with domestic resource mobilization. You know, there are some countries in the world who collect very little taxes, and some of them are very poor countries. Uh, some, some countries are collecting uh, taxes that are at below 10% of GDP. But we know how to help. And so along with uh, the IMF and Christine Lagarde, we've committed to helping every country in the world. We're gonna put a package together to help them broaden their tax base and collect taxes. Every one of the leaders at the last meeting of the World Bank Group said to us, and this is from the developing countries, we want to be better at tax collection because we want to control our own future. Now, it's going to be tough. There are going to be some tough political decisions that have to be made, but we think that the package of support can help them do that. So that's just one part of it. Another is illicit financial flows. This is a huge issue. This is literally people engaged in illegal activities, stealing uh, uh, minerals, for example, and leaving the country. But there's another piece of it that, that uh, the African leaders especially are very focused on, and that is companies who make a lot of money in developing countries but pay no taxes there. Uh, OECD and Anhel Guria are working on something uh, called base erosion and profit shifting, which tries to follow the ways in which individuals and companies end up not paying taxes by moving their profits uh, to, to various tax havens. Uh, this is a, a, a problem that Jens and his colleagues are talking about and thinking about all the time. And if we can stop that flow, uh, the outflow of these illicit funds, that's another huge chunk of money that could be used for the purpose of ending extreme poverty. And then, of course, you have official development assistance. And because that's grant-based, we really think that we have to rethink official development assistance and make sure that it's leveraging all the other potential sources of money in the most effective way. Could official development assistance, for example, um, uh, uh, put in some seed capital uh, to attract uh, more foreign direct investment, for, for example, in some of these countries? These are questions that I think we simply must ask in a, in a very different way. And then for banks like us, we have a concessional lending. We, this is... Um, uh, typically uh, a 0% interest loan for which you get a 10-year grace period for payback and then you pay it back over 30 years. So depending on interest rates at any given time, that kind of loan turns out to be 60, 70, sometimes 80% grant. And it's the, it's, it, uh, the countries love to get this money. Now, uh, going further, uh, the World Bank, the way we do our business is we have one of the best AAA credit ratings in the world, and so we go to the markets based on our AAA credit rating, based on the capital we have. We leverage our existing capital. We go to the markets and we borrow at, uh, you know, uh, whatever LIBOR is, minus 25 or 30 basis points. And then we lend at LIBOR plus, you know, 40 or 50 basis points. So we have a margin 
but the margin only pays for our operations. We're not a profit-making institution. So um, uh, even the middle-income countries, uh, even, even though they complain sometimes about us being slow and having too many safeguards, those safeguards are really important. We're speeding up, and business has never been better. We're, the demands for our uh, uh, middle-income country loans at LIBOR plus 50 or 30 or 40 basis points has never been, never been higher. So now, if you begin to bring all these things and then you add the private sector, you actually get to trillions of dollars for development assistance. Now, uh, there is all this money potentially floating around. Uh, you know, w w as we all know, uh, there's plenty of liquidity in the world, and it's sitting on the sidelines earning almost nothing. If we could mobilize uh, that liquidity to invest in infrastructure projects, which have, you know, over the last 30 years been relatively safe, uh, even relatively safe in developing countries, despite the fact that many uh, uh, investors see emerging markets and, and certainly countries in Africa as hugely risky, we've actually looked at the numbers and the risk profiles are not that different between developed and developing country um, uh, in, uh, infrastructure investments. So, there's this huge uh, uh, amount of money potentially going to end extreme poverty, but we've got to make it work. And it's going to be the work of institutions like ours and people in finance to make it happen. Now, uh, let's, let's look at uh, 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 the strategy. So if you have all this money, what do you do? Well, we look back at uh, 50 years of the World Bank experience in, in ending extreme poverty, and we found three things that are the most critical. The first is grow. The economies have to grow. Economies have to create jobs. That's, of course, the best way to lift uh, anyone out of poverty is to give them a job. About two-thirds of all poverty reduction uh, over the past um, uh, 20, or th 20 or 25 years has been on the, result, on the basis of economic growth that led to job creation. The second, though, that some pe many people didn't think of uh, uh, as, um, as directly related to this growth issue is invest, investing in human beings, mostly in health and education. We have lots of new data that suggests that health, improving health outcomes is a great boon for growth. Uh, no less than Larry Summers showed that from 2000 to 2011, improvements in health uh, increased um, uh, whole income, incomes of people by about 25%. So in other words, for, uh, for people in developing countries, better health outcomes had as much as a 25% impact on the growth of their income. So it's not just an expense, it's actually an investment, certainly in medium and long-term growth, uh, but perhaps even in short-term growth. In education, of course, we now have plenty of data that suggests that, that, that good uh, educational outcomes at 15 or 16 can have a direct impact on uh, medium and long-term uh, uh, economic growth. And finally, the, the third thing that we've uh, begun to understand is a critical part of ending extreme poverty is to ensure. Now, you know, 20 years ago, um, uh, I was actually part of a movement uh, called 50 Years is Enough. And that movement uh, argued that the World Bank and, uh, and the IMF on their 50th birthdays should close as institutions. I was actually on the streets protesting, I wrote a book. Uh, and, and the reason we did that, uh, the reason we did it, and you can clap if you'd like, uh, uh, those of you who, who may still be part of that movement, uh, I can tell you that I'm very glad we lost that argument. And I'm very glad we lost that argument, and this is probably the one area that tells you the most about how much the World Bank has changed. Back in those days, social welfare programs at the World Bank uh, were uh, not very well thought of. Uh, they were uh, uh, thought of as things that maybe one could consider much later, but uh, really weren't thinking about them very much as, as uh, in necessary interventions for the poorest countries. We are now the greatest champions of cash transfer programs, and it's because the data was there. The World Bank actually studied whether conditional cash transfer programs in Mexico and Brazil had a positive or negative impact on the people and then on economic growth. And the results were so positive that we have now been uh, uh, pushing these programs for everyone. So ensuring that people don't fall back into poverty is also a critical part of, um, of, uh, um, uh, of tackling the, qu the question of poverty. So for ending extreme poverty, it's not just money. 
And it's not just giving people money, but it's using the money that exists in the world to make the investments for growth, to investing in people using the best techniques of actually improving health outcomes and not just spending on health, and of having kids actually learn in school, not just sit in school. You know, we can build the schools, but they actually have to learn. And finally, we have to protect people from plunging into poverty, which gets me to my next big worry that keeps me up at night, pandemics. Unfortunately, with Ebola, we found that we are wholly unprepared. And Ebola is a slow-moving virus. Many of you may have heard of MERS, the, the um, Middle Eastern Respiratory uh, Syndrome that had afflicted um, uh, the Arab countries. Now it's in Korea. Korea's closed all their schools, and there, there's a case that may be going to China. MERS is um, uh, the, 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 the um, organism that causes MERS is a coronavirus. And any of you who know what that means, the coronavirus is the same family of viruses that cause SARS. Now, SARS can be transmitted through the air, can be, it could be transmitted through the air. MERS is relatively, um, uh, it can be transmissible in hospital settings, but it doesn't move that quickly and it's not that frightening. What is really frightening, and some of you in this room may know of people who suffered from it, is, is the kind of flu that happened in 1918. The 1918 flu pandemic killed 25 million people in 25 uh, weeks. Uh, and this was at a time when there was 50%, excuse me, 50 times less cross-border travel than there is today. Uh, Bill Gates and his foundation did the best research on this, and he's, he, he's saying, uh, and just as everyone else is, that a virus of this virulence that moves this quickly is almost certain to happen in our lifetimes. Now, no one can give you the exact date. That's part of the problem. But if this happens, and, uh, it, and it behaves the same way as the 1918 flu pandemic, then it's going to be as many as 35 million people killed within 250 days. What is that going to do to the global economy? Well, our predictions are it's going gonna, it's gonna to take, it's going to cause anywhere between a 5 and 10 percent hit on global GDP. And uh, you know, nominal uh, global GDP is what, 75 to 80 trillion dollars. So we're talking about a potential four to eight trillion dollar hit for which we are completely unprepared. Now, you know, when I go to meetings of uh, finance ministers and central bank governors and listen to people like Jens, I'm just so impressed with how hard they think about potential downside risks to the global economy. Well, here's the biggest one you can imagine. Insurance executives, 30,000 of them in a Towers Watson survey a couple of years ago, when asked what is the one, number one threat to the world and to your business, the number one threat was pandemics. So I recently, um, actually now it's not so recently, it's about a year and a half ago, I had the great uh, privilege of meeting Nicholas von Baumhardt, who's the CEO of Munich Re, the reinsurance company. Now, the reinsurance companies literally hold the risk of pandemic in their hands because they hold all the business disruption policies, not all of them, but they hold a lot of business disruption policies. So if the world stops, no one can travel, business stops, uh, and, and a business takes a loss, the reinsurance company has to pay them. So I said, I said to Nicholas, you know, what, what, what are you thinking? He said, you know, we, we, we're going crazy because we're seeing that this risk is very real. We're looking and modeling all the time. We're not part of the discussion. And we know we're unprepared. So I actually brought them into the discussion. And now we're going to try to build a system where the World Health Organization is stronger. It's got to get stronger than what it was. That we build functioning health systems, something which uh, uh, GIZ and KFW and other German organizations are very much involved in, build functioning health systems in each country. We have to organize with all the different uh, potential private sector groups that can help us, from drug companies to transport companies to cell phone companies. I met the CEO of Vodafone um, uh, a few months ago, and he said to me, when Ebola broke out, we thought you needed uh, help in communications. You know, we have these cell phone towers and suitcases. We could have given them to you, and nobody called us. So all of the pre-arrangements that need to be done in order to make sure everyone's ready hadn't been done, we've got to do that now. And the one thing that's going to be different this time, the one thing that I think will really make a difference is finance. Because uh, uh, if in the Ebola response, the World Bank was the first group to make a pledge, $200 million on August 4th, eight months after the epidemic started. If pandemic flu hits, we're going to have to be ready to move in eight minutes, in eight days, in eight weeks, certainly not in eight months. 
And so we are bringing together um, financing instruments, and I personally would like to get the reinsurance companies involved because then they can give us independent assessments of preparedness. Now, the way we do it uh, right now is that countries tell us whether or not they're prepared, but they tell us whether or not prepared based on their own uh, uh, free, uh, well, let me put it this way. It's a voluntary program where countries do a self-assessment. So we may be able to trust it, we may not. And so for me, having a private sector company setting premium rates on the basis of their hard-headed assessment of preparedness is uh, the one thing that could help us really change uh, where we're going. I've made a promise um, to my colleagues and to, uh, to everyone uh, that as long as I'm president of the World Bank, I will not let any of us off the hook in ensuring that this system is in place. And again, I would say finance uh, will be the key. Now, uh, in terms of climate change, two of the things that we've discussed that are directly related to finance and uh, very important aspects of the climate change response. The first is to find a price on carbon. And to my great surprise and delight, six oil and gas companies in Europe have now issued a statement saying that we need a price on carbon. Now, I know the experience here in Europe uh, ha has, been, uh, has been up and down, has not, has not been, I think, what everyone had hoped. But I think if we can get everyone on board, China is doing a lot of experimenting uh, with carbon taxes. I think the movement toward getting a price on carbon, which finance people will have to be involved in, is a critical part of going forward. And another part is just getting rid of fossil fuel subsidies. So fossil fuel subsidies, we've done the analysis, they are among the most regressive taxes in any uh, developing country. Uh, the top 20% receive six times the benefit from fossil fuel subsidies as uh, the bottom 20%, six times. So it is essentially a regressive tax. If we get rid of fossil fuel subsidies, it'll reduce carbon in the air, and uh, more than anything else, um, it will set the right incentives uh, for the kind of clean, sustainable development that we need. Now, to finish, I want to leave you two other quotes of Goethe. Now, you know, I think, when I, when I um, uh, heard that I was going to be at the Goethe Universität, I, um, I, I thought, oh, great, I get to quote Goethe. I don't usually get to quote Goethe. But here's one, here's one for the students. I presented to you lots of really, really hard problems. Uh, but um, one of the things that Goethe said, and, I, and I'm really speaking right to the students, magic is believing in yourself. If you can do that, you can make anything happen. And believe me, look, I'm this immigrant kid from, uh, from Korea. My parents were refugees in the war, and here I am, president of the World Bank. I never thought that would happen. And um, uh, moreover, I'm president of the World Bank, and I started out life as a simple-minded doctor. So if you believe that story, truly, you can do anything. And I want to leave this other uh, quote for central bankers here in the audience today. Um, uh, as we tackle these seemingly intractable problems, and as you do it from your perch as uh, people who are really running the finance world, remember this. Goethe said that when a human awakens to a great dream and throws the full force of his soul over it, all the universe conspires in your favor. You know, um, I... Uh, uh, I go back to the first quote, and the very first quote uh, that I, that I uh, said was an important one. It's not enough to know uh, we must apply. Uh, it's not enough to have a will uh, we must do. It's not enough just to know about the problem of poverty in the world. We've got to take everything we know about ending poverty and we must do. It's not enough to know that pandemics could kill tens of millions of people and destroy the world economy for a big chunk of time. We have got to put the systems in place that can stop pandemics in their tracks. It's not enough to just know that climate change is going to affect the lives of our children. We must do the things, especially in the area of finance, that we know that we can do right now. You know, um, at the G7 leaders meeting, Chancellor Merkel challenged us all, and without quoting Goethe, she challenged us all in just this way. She said, it's not enough just to have meetings of leaders. 
Every one of you have to make commitments. And then next year in Japan, we have to hold each other accountable. We must apply and we must do for the sake of the poorest, for the sake of the climate and for our children, and for the sake of our collective humanity. Thank you very much. You know, Asians are always good with electronics, right? So. <laughs> listening, listening to you, I was in 1995 in Madrid at the occasion of the <clears throat> meeting of the World Bank and the IMF, and I saw the protesters in the streets, 50 years is enough, and I think we are all glad that you move from the side of the protesters to the side of the actors. <laughs> I, I hope I, I, hello, hello. There we go. Yes, I, I, I hope that. Um, can you hear me? No. Try that. Yes, I, um, um, I, I hope that I wasn't there at the same time, and if I was, I hope I wasn't rude. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> I at least tried to be a polite protester at that time. <laughs> um, I think you really gave a global perspective, global as to the dimensions of the problems, and global covering the whole world. And uh, having listened to you, I think anybody here in the room who was not aware before is now aware that we live in a real, in one world, Absolutely. in a world in which the speed of contagion could be so fast. Uh, and uh, sometimes when we build our models, uh, we think about big risks and we might leave out the biggest risks. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, what, uh, what number do we give to such a risk? Uh, we, never, we, we don't know when and if and in what dimension it would happen but we have to take that into account. And what you made also clear, very clear, that uh, we live in an interdependent world, and uh, it's not just the developing world, depending on financial help, et cetera, but the industrial world. You mentioned that two-thirds of growth is coming, has come from uh, developing world, including China, so industrial countries have delivered uh, just a small part uh, a small part of it, and I think it was also interesting to see uh, that you mentioned uh, it's not a lack of money, it's a lack of investing money for the right purposes. Uh, so, but I'm not here to give another speech, uh, <clears throat> which would be disappointing anyway. So I uh, open the floor and encourage you to uh, ask your questions to President Kim, who will start. Here, Mike, and you are the next. Next is here. Thank you. Uh, can I move from the, from the Bundestag to the Bundestag? Can the Bundestag to the Bundestag? No. Here. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, and thank you for giving an excellent and very, very thought-provoking um, um, talk, which I, which I very much appreciated. I have one question related to the mobilization of resources that you mentioned, both um, from, the, from the public um, sector, so fiscal resources and, and private. 
I think the World Bank has a very good track record in making sure that the money gets um, where it's supposed to be, that um, impact assessment is there. So because I, I think many people have many ideas what can be done with this, with this money. So can you tell us a bit more on how you make sure that you're reaching the goals, that you're defining the goals, and that there's a good um, impact assessment? Because I guess there's a lot of uncertainty also what, what works and what doesn't work. We, uh, we audit every single, you can join me down here if you'd like, uh, but I, I think this, is it work now? But so, so we audit every single one of our projects and we have very, very uh, high standards when it comes to chasing down corruption. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting story. Um, uh, in 1996, in, when my good friend Jim Wolfenson, re, he, took, he took over the World Bank a, few year, a year before that, and he wrote in his own speech, we must tackle the cancer of corruption. And every single one of his advisors said, you can't say that. He said, why not? He said, because then we would have no countries to do business with anymore. Right? But Jim turned around and said, no, we're going to continue to do business, but with our funds, we're going to track them, we're going to trace them, and we're going to do everything we can to fight corruption in our own way. Now, does corruption exist? I can tell you yes, and I can tell you in every single country in the world, bar none. It exists. Uh, but what we were able to do is, with that really very courageous stand in putting corruption on the table, then Paul Volcker, the former head of the, the Fed in the United States, came on board and, and helped us develop a whole anti-corruption system. So uh, when we uh, see companies, for example, that have uh, bribed uh, public officials, we let the public officials know, they take them through their own mechanisms, and we debar the companies, and the companies can't do business with us, or because we have cross-debarment, any of the other multilateral development banks uh, for a certain period of time. And we've debarred some big companies in doing this. And tracing every single dollar, making sure it happens is not easy. So for example, in Afghanistan, um, we uh, uh, were doing projects in places that were really hard to get to. When I visited, uh, I was driving around in an armored vehicle. And they told me, well, this is a very, very high level armored vehicle, right? And they said it can withstand uh, uh, IEDs, improvised explosive devices, but still doesn't do too well with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, hand-launched grenades. And I'm looking at the driver saying that it's supposed to make me feel better. That, uh, uh, but, but that's how difficult it is. And so what we've done is we've given cell phones with cameras to local women. And uh, they go by the project, and they take pictures, and they transmit them to us. And every time they do that, they get minutes on their phone. Uh, but if they're stopped, there is a single button they can push that erases all the pictures so they don't get in trouble. So that's how far we go to try to make sure that the money uh, is used well. That's also why some countries uh, complain about us being slow. But we're slow because we want to make sure that we're not damaging the environment, that we're not uh, uh, displacing people, that we're not doing all kinds of other things that we have done in the past and that we still may do in the future. But we've got as good a system at tracing that as I think uh, anybody in the world. Next question. If the mics work, we'll use them. If not, All right. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Jose Quintana Diaz. I'm a PhD student here at Goethe University. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'm what me uh, what me keeps uh, awake at night, apart from writing my thesis, <laughs> is the question to to the limits of growth. Um, we have a lot of evidence about the planetary boundaries, and I see it at the fourth challenge, which is really um, overarching the planetary boundaries. And we have a lot of empirical evidence with regard to the Club of Rome and so on. So what's your perspective with regard to this? Because I think um, resource, we know resources are scarce and um, prices react to this. And it, will, um, it might increase even more due to the growth, poverty, pandemics, and climate change. Uh, so. Um, that's what keeps me awake at night, and I would love to um, that you could address some points to this point. Thanks. You know, I, it's a great question, and um, if uh, if I look back on my own life and say, what are the things that have really changed the world in fundamental ways over time? I think social movements have changed the world, and I was part of a social movement, for example, uh, to treat people in Africa living with HIV, and that social movement worked in changing people's minds about the possibility of treating people with HIV in Africa. And I, I think the fact that we did it had a huge impact on the economic prospects of Africa. So social movements are really important. Now, um, is a social movement going to help us tackle climate change? 
I hope so. I, I, I really hope so. But I've now been hanging around with these brilliant economists for so long that I'm completely convinced that if you change the incentives and uh, incentivize low carbon growth, that we're going to begin seeing things that we can't even imagine now. Because right now the incentives are not strong enough to move in a direction of, of spurring growth, but in a sustainable way. It's, it's not there yet. This is why we're fo so focused on carbon pricing. Now, we, we, we know that carbon pricing is no panacea, uh, but if you were to align the incentives so that uh, your, that r the real growth in industry, for example, uh, was going to be finding ways of capturing uh, solar energy, storing it more effectively, moving it across borders. In other words, uh, turning solar energy into baseload. This is hard to do, but if the incentives were aligned, I bet you uh, that all the smartest people in this room, if they got there, if they put their heads to it, uh, that's what we'd like. That, that I think it would happen. So my own view is we have to, uh, in, the, in the area of climate change, in the area of the limits of our planet, the issue is so critical that we have to, on the one hand, do everything we can to start a social movement, get young people to realize that, hey, wait, wait a minute, you're doing this to our planet, right? Uh, you know, you may be in a meeting talking about shareholder returns on particular kinds of uh, natural um, uh, resources, but what we're talking about is a world in which Thailand is not underwater by 2030. I mean, Bangkok is not underwater by 2030. We're talking about a world in which every year we have record heat waves and every year we have these disasters that basically wipe out the possibility of life on some of these small island states. That's what we're talking about. And I hope that social movement uh, uh, rises up and, and, and begins to change people's behavior. But I think in the meantime, let's do everything we can to change the incentives so that the economic, uh, uh, economic incentives are aligned in the right way. That's my own view, and I think once that happens, we're going to see innovations that are just not seeing it to the light of day right now. Now, you know, I have to tell you, for pandemics, it's harder because um, uh, the nature of, uh, of the potential damage of, you know, the, the 1918 flu, the flu at pandemic, was the first time that human flu and bird flu came together. And when it came together, it killed that many people. Uh, now, you know, some people say that there are, there are nefarious uh, individuals in laboratories right now trying to recreate something like that. I, I don't know if that's true or not, you know, bioterrorism. But certainly, uh, with the way that we're moving now, all these different kinds of viruses are coming in contact with each other. Could one combination be as lethal or even more lethal than Spanish flu? You bet. But what are the incentives? for uh, the drug companies to uh, make viruses to something that may never happen, right? How do, you, how do you do that? That's very complicated. I think the drug companies have been extremely um, generous in, in trying to continue these efforts despite the, the lack of clarity of a market. But one of the things I'm hoping for is that if we can get enough interest in this pandemic financial facility that we could create enough of an advanced market signal that many more uh, drug companies would be interested in making vaccines because the potential payoff could be much higher. Could we set up some sort of system that everyone who works on a vaccine for a particular uh, disease, when it comes, there's a big payout and they get a share of it even if they, hadn't, if, even if they didn't make the vaccine that worked? I don't know. But I have to tell you that if you want to get things done really quickly and bring all the ingenuity of the world, you got to get the economic incentives right. So Michael Taliasis from CFS. Um, you mentioned you stress a lot uh, poverty and, um, and uh, the 3% that you cannot uh, get rid of. Now, one um, important factor that could help uh, people avoid poverty is managing their risks through financial instruments and through financial innovation. So, I want to ask you if the World Bank uh, has any initiative to promote financial innovation in the right direction, not to complicate things and to confuse people, but actually to help them manage risks. And uh, secondly, if, they want, if you have any initiative to promote financial education so that people actually know that uh, these instruments exist. It's a, it's a great question. So here are a few things uh, that, that we're, we want to do. So, for example, um, in healthcare, about 100 million people every year 
become impoverished due to uh, health expenses. Right? And so uh, we set a goal of trying to figure out a way so that no one would become impoverished just to try to keep their family members healthy. And that means uh, you know, health care coverage all over, uh, for everybody. Uh, and you might off the top of your head say, well, how can you set up a health care uh, insurance program in a really poor country? Well, good news is that countries have done it. Rwanda, and I was in Rwanda when uh, President Kagame said, we're going to have a mutuelle that's going to cover everybody. And we thought he was crazy. We thought it would never work. Well, guess what? It's in place, and it's working. And it is preventing uh, these catastrophic payments for, for, for health outcomes. That's one. And, and we know that that can be done. Uh, but another is just giving uh, poor people access to accounts, transaction accounts. Right now, uh, uh, the two billion people who don't have access to financial services literally keep their money underneath, um, underneath their beds. And what we found is that, uh, for example, farmers uh, uh, often in India the end of the cycle, right before harvest, comes right at the time when they're making decisions about their daughter's education. And as they run out of money right prior to uh, the harvest, they make bad decisions, especially about their daughter's education. And so when we gave them a little bit, I mean, this is tiny amounts of credit, right before that time, they made better decisions about their daughter's education. So here, if you give them transaction accounts, if you let them borrow small amounts of money, and uh, you know, Prime Minister Modi has, uh, has said, everyone's going to get a bank account. And then people sort of said, well, what are you going to do with those bank accounts? And then he said, all the payments that we give to poor people, instead of going through the multiple layers of the Indian bureaucracy, we're going to send it right to them, which I think shocked a lot of people. But now that makes sense. And if you can also, uh, you know, um, in, at our last meetings in, uh, in, in April, along with Queen Maxima. Um, you know, Queen Maxima of the Netherlands is a remarkable person. Her husband, King Willem, is also tremendously committed to water issues. We work with them. But she is actually from the finance world. She worked on Wall Street. And so she's now helping us with this, uh, with this program to get everyone in the world access to financial services by 2020. Now, if we do that, if we can get everyone an account and give everyone access to small amounts of credit, I mean, we saw how successful Muhammad Yunus's and other programs were in getting women access to small loans. You could actually create a system where they would get it. Now, we have to be careful. We have to make sure that they don't become over-indebted. We have to make sure that they don't fall victim to these credit card uh, uh, scams, and et cetera. But we think that the innovation here is getting basic services to everyone. Now, you know, this watch I'm wearing here, I bought in Kenya through an online payment program called M-Pesa, right? Unbelievable program where it, with an incredibly simple interface, people send money back and forth to each other. My host was a minister who was himself Maasai. And his mother and father speak no language but Maasai. They're both illiterate and innumerate. But they have a cell phone. And every time they need money, they, they push one button that calls their son and says, we need some money. All right? He says, OK, I, I have it coming. He sends them money. They take the cell phone, and they go into the local store where the person who runs the store uh, reads and writes English. And they said, um, and she goes in, and she says, my son sent me some money. And, and they go, OK, what's your, what's your, what's your uh, code? So I don't know. But every time, every time I've been here before, you push this button like this, zero, 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 and then they give me money, right? And so he's able to give her money. And now it turns out that, that many people in Africa only use mobile banking with their cell phones. So there are so many things that we can do to help even the poorest people manage their money better. And it turns out that those things make a huge difference in how their kids do, right? You help them manage their money, their finances better, their kids are not stunted as much, right? They, they, they get better nutrition. So I, I'm all for these innovations. And there are young people running all over the world trying these things out. Our, our role is to take the best ideas and scale them up. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, <coughs> Thank Bye. you very much. My name is Murray Hill from the Hochschule of Hosenius. Um, I found your speech very inspiring, and I liked uh, your outline on the 230 goal, the pandemics and climate change. Um, we've already seen the impact of the Millennium Development Goals 
You've mentioned also uh, the impact of micro credit introduced, for example, by Mohammed Yunus. Uh, but I'm thinking now of a problem which uh, uh, impacts very much on us now as Europeans watching day by day as refugees make the trip from Africa to our shores. And we seem helpless to offer these people hope before they even make that perilous journey. I'd like to hear your view on that issue. Thank you. Th thank you for your question. So, um, you know, I was once one of those, uh, you know, hapless people. Uh, um, I, was, I, I took an airplane, but um, uh, I emigrated to the United States from a country, uh, get this, so in 1959 I was born, and I've looked at documents from the 50s and 60s in the World Bank talking about South Korea, right? Literacy rate was probably 15%. The number of people in South Korea who had a college education was about 5%. Um, all of the minerals, the, the, the natural wealth, and the industrial base was north of the 38th parallel. Okay? And so our, our, uh, our wonderful economists at the World Bank predicted that Korea would never develop. Okay? Only agriculture, very poorly educated workforce, it's not going to develop. Right? So I, every time I say that, I risk, so are they thinking the same thing about what we're telling them now? That, uh, that's not the message. Uh, the message is we're better now at uh, doing analysis. And I think also more humble, all right? So I'm a, I was an immigrant to the United States from a very poor country at the time. The, when I left Korea, the GDP of Korea was around uh, the level of Ghana, right? Um, and uh, I, I like to think that, that myself and others have made contributions uh, to, to, to the United States. Now, um, uh, you know, one of the things we have to do is to create better situations so that they don't, at home, so they don't feel like they have to get on these rickety boats and go, right? So that's, that's, that's a really important piece of it, to fear for your life, uh, to be excluded from uh, society so much that you feel like you have to, at risk of your own life, leave. That's not a situation that uh, we should tolerate and we need to make things better. On the other hand, I, 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 let me just put this thought in your head. I think that there are many economies in the world that have to get their heads around a different approach to their national identity. And I think there are many countries, especially the developed advanced economies, who have to begin thinking that uh, an image of ourselves as a pluralistic uh, country, welcoming new citizens from all over the world, many of whom are willing to do jobs that we're no longer willing to do, is the best thing we can do. It enriches our country, it makes us stronger. Now, there are some countries, countries that I know very well, countries that I was born in, that are struggling with this right now. And uh, let me just put that out as a challenge. Here, and let me, I'm, I'm really working to get the Koreans specifically uh, to take this on. Uh, you know, Koreans are doing so well. And, and I have to tell you, the admiration that all of us Koreans grew up for Germans was stunning. I mean, they, they, we, we heard about, uh, German diligence and persistence and scientific uh, uh, minds. We heard about this all the time. And uh, uh, I think that in the minds of all Koreans, we still think of ourselves as nowhere near as diligent as Germans. And that's actually proven out in surveys. If you ask, there's a survey that says, are you a diligent, hardworking person? The two countries who rank lowest on the scale, the lowest on the scale is Japan, the second lowest on the scale is Korea, right? So even though the students go to school from 7 in the morning until 11 at night, and the only reason they, go to, they stop going to school at 11 at night is because they made a law that you can't go to school after 11 at night, right? the, the, the Koreans are still worried about the quality of their education and, and somehow think that, that, I think many of them, that Germany does it better. Okay, now, now having said that, what I said to the Koreans is this. As good as their system is, the really bright young people are, are getting stopped when they leave school because ageism is so severe. You have to be in your 50s to be taken seriously sometimes in these companies. There's such an incredible hierarchy, right? And so when you get to my age in Korea 55, the reality of the matter is that you have been taking crap for so long, right, that you're happy that you're finally not having to take crap, right? But then that is in instilling in the system an inability for the best new ideas to come up, and therefore, 
the digital immigrants, sometimes not even immigrants, right? The digital immigrants are running a world in which the digital natives are going to dominate. So they have to get over ageism. Women in the workforce, it's still not where it should be in Korea, and there's an incredible reserve force of brilliant women who would raise uh, GDP you know, uh, several points just by beginning to enter the workforce. Still not there, right? And finally, uh, it's new immigrants. So what I said to the Koreans, and I would say this to everybody really, the generation that decides that it's gonna get past ageism, sexism, and racism is the generation that's going to determine the future of Korea. Otherwise, they're gonna be in trouble. But I think it applies everywhere. Getting over ageism, sexism, and racism are three challenges that are not usually in the World Bank quiver of activities, but I can tell you that it will be important for every advanced country in the world. So, while we work on improving the situation in their homes, because they deserve it and we need to, uh, I think there has to be a new conversation in every country about immigrants. And I think there has to be a new con a conversation in every country about how being truly patriotic will mean accepting people who don't look like you, who don't at first speak the same language, and accepting them as Germans, as Italians, as Koreans. <clears throat> Very uh, mathematician. Thank you very much for a speech that has given uh, some view and some insight into the thinking of the current thinking of the World Bank. You emphasized the issue of the pandemics, and I think it's a very serious problem. The problem is you talked about being prepared, preparedness level for handling the pandemics. I'm just wondering how the World Bank uh, would set up a model actually to do that because you are going to have to expand the modeling of epidemiology, epidemiological models to encompass the possibility of an anticipatory version in the model in order to be able to handle it. Now, if you look at European history, the pest gives, an, uh, gives some idea of what happens when you have increasing urbanization. So I'm coming to the real problem which the World Bank we may have to address. We are beginning to get the problem of megacities. The cities are increasing in number, in size, in density, and you also have the problem of the mobility between these regions. Uh, for the time being, let's ignore the issue of the relationship between the megacities and the rural, the rural areas. So the question that comes into the uh, possibility of modeling the pandemics will be, how do you intend to predict the growth of the possibility of some type of virus emerging from one of these mega cities? And through the fast communication channels, mobility of people, at the same time, trigger off similar developments elsewhere. This was, a, if you look at the statistics, which some of the then institutions established in Europe, the transition of the pest from once, uh, one of the, some, some of the urban areas to beginning from Italy, then across Central Europe until it got as far as to Britain. So here we have a problem. The question is how much is the World Bank going to invest its effort and its resources into establishing the fact that a wide range model, which will also incorporate re new risk understanding and profiling, will be, can emerge in order to deal with the pandemic's problem. I think I got it. Right. Right, thank you. Uh, it's a great question. It's, it's a really great question. So there are, there are many levels of, uh, of, of answering that question. And I think the honest answer is, we haven't done enough of that work yet. There's, there's no question about it. Um, do we have uh, a plan for a Spanish flu type epidemic for every major city in the world? The answer is no, we do not. But we've got to get there. We've got to get there and we've got to figure out how to do it. 
Uh, in some senses, cities make it much more difficult. In some senses, cities may, may be able to make it easier. Uh, it, it, you know, and, and if there's a lesson we learned from Ebola, it's that probably at the end of the day, the thing that made the biggest difference is community-based communication that changed people's behavior. I, it, it really, you know, if, if, um, if something is communicated, if I can sneeze from here and infect people in the first row, which is how flu works, uh, then you're really in trouble because it's really hard and you've got to move quickly, quarantines, you've got to stop air transport. That is a really big problem. But for Ebola, where you have to have intimate contact, you have to actually touch and then get into your mucous membranes, et cetera, nothing's ever gone through plain skin, but you, you know, it, it, in, in those kinds of things, behavior change at, at, at the point of the outbreak can stop an epidemic. So uh, the, the, the point is, for everything from slow-moving viruses to very fast-moving viruses, you have to have a plan for every single one. You even have to have a plan uh, for bioterrorism that if they put it into the air conditioning system, for example. Now, are we doing it in little bits and pieces? I, 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 you know, I would say probably the Gates Foundation has done a lot of this stuff. Uh, I'm, I know that the United States Centers for Disease Control does a lot of this stuff. And other um, uh, departments of public health, I'm sure, do some of it. But we now have to do it on a global scale. And we have to do it understanding that it's about people first and foremost but it's also about stopping uh, something from literally crashing the world economy uh, for weeks and perhaps months at a time. The reason that, that, that I, as a World Bank president, am so concerned about this is because I know who's going to get hit the hardest if the global economy stops for that period of time. It's the poor. The poor will be hit the hardest. And then our own efforts at ending poverty will be set back probably decades. Right? So it hasn't been done yet. but. Uh, we are capable of doing that modeling, and we have to do it. You know, the doctors, what we used to complain about all the time when I was in doing uh, just global health is, yeah, okay, so, you know, we get the attention of the ministers of health, but what we really want is the attention of the ministers of finance. Well, I have the intention of every minister of finance at least once a year, right? And I, I'm not making the argument based just on humanitarian terms. Humanitarian terms is important. I'm making the argument on the notion that if we're serious about protecting the global economy from real downside risks, this is a relatively minor investment in protecting uh, what could be a devastating uh, 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 outcome. Does that make sense, Jens? <laughs> Do you I'm allow, sorry, I mean, I'll come back up here. Do you allow for one more question? Sure. Or take this side here. Thank you. I'm Cornelia Kirtel. I'm an intern at the GIZ, and I studied development economics. And I actually have two last questions. <laughs> so the first one is that I think the World Bank has one of the best resettlement policies. However, it has been often reported that those settlement policies were not that well implemented. And I was wondering what you will do to make the implementation better. A second question is that um, some academics would say that financialization is a huge problem to, uh, for inequality within countries and across countries and also for domestic resource mobilization. And I was wondering, what are your thoughts on that? Do you agree with that? And what do you think to do about it? What, what, do, you you. Mean, excuse me, what do you mean financialization? Um, so it's the process that um, financial services, the share of them is increasing in GDP. And that a lot of capital is flowing out of developing countries being invested in the financial markets. Yeah. yeah. So on the first question. So um, resettlement uh, happens. Uh, when you build infrastructure, right? And it happens even more when you build infrastructure in cities, okay? How many people today uh, drove in here on a road, a paved road? Everybody, right? How many people here use public transportation today? There you go, All right? So every single one of you got here because somebody was resettled, right? So resettlement happens when you build infrastructure. Right. Now, let me ask, did Germany, did Germany provide 
um, uh, uh, compensation to everyone who was resettled? Probably yes, right? Maybe not long, long time ago, but probably yes. Did Germany pay uh, compensation to squatters who came on the land after they heard that a project was going to start? No, right? I don't think any country has done that. Guess what? That's what we do at the World Bank Group. Uh, because we have such a hard time determining who was squatting and who was not, we actually provide compensation to anyone who's on the land, including squatters. Now, uh, the problem of resettling and not paying compensation is a terrible, terrible thing. And, and we, uh, this was long before I became president of the World Bank, but what we found was that in many cases we didn't follow our rules to the letter, right? And, and you know, the Guardian came out and said four million people. Th that uh, was completely wrong. And the Guardian, if you go back and look at the whole series of articles, said that that they had that they had not uh, they misquoted because some of them it wasn't that everyone lost their land. And this is just how infrastructure goes. Sometimes you go over a piece of the land and you provide compensation. And we didn't do as well as we could. So, in the future. We will continue with this plan to provide uh, compensation for everyone, including uh, uh, people who are squatters, because you know, for them, this is their only chance at finding steady housing. We, we don't have the, the wherewithal to be able to tell who's squatting and who's not, so we're going to give compensation to everyone. And we're investing a lot more to make sure that we can follow up more. But the reason I brought up the first example is that I, I just sometimes think there's a bit of hypocrisy here, that it's OK for since, since we in the developed world have all our roads and a lot of our infrastructure built, um, we don't have to think as much about resettlement. I, I can tell you there are places in Europe right now that are going through huge fights about potential resettlement, about something that's called, in legal terms, eminent domain. The state can take your property if there's something that they're doing for the good of the whole that they decide is for the good of the whole. Right? And so, you, you know, think with me here, right? Uh, what is everyone saying we need in developing countries? Infrastructure, right? And so we're in the business of helping countries build infrastructure, and often that leads to resettlement. So our resolution of that was to say, um, we are going to be committed to compensating everyone, uh, and including squatters, and that going forward, we're going to do much better at making sure that we uh, follow our rules. But on the one hand, you can't go in one room and say, why isn't the World Bank building more infrastructure? And on the other hand, go into another room and say, uh, build infrastructure, but don't resettle anybody, right? I, I, you know, this is, this is where I sit. I sit in the middle of a, a situation where I am told that if we can build a particular road that will, uh, lower, that, that will finally provide poor farmers with access to markets, and that's the most important thing for them. And on the other hand, I face a group of people who say, you shouldn't be building roads because you might have to resettle people. Right? So we will always try to do the best that we can, uh, but uh, I don't think that poor people should have to face uh, a life without any infrastructure uh, because we feel that no one should be resettled. We, we're going to have to do it. We're just going to have to do it better. That's, that's the answer to the first question. Now, you know, um, uh, uh, what's the net flow of money into and out of, uh, of developing countries? Well, part of, the, part of the answer to that is the, is the answer I gave earlier. There are a lot of illicit flows that we don't know about and we really can't account for. And so if you counted for all that, is more money leaving developing countries than going in? You know, it, it, it's possible. I, you know, I, it, we, we keep very close accounts of what's happening in particular countries, but we don't know about, about the illicit flows. I would put it this way. Um, in this day and age, there are very few countries that live completely outside of the global market system. Uh, very few countries. Uh, you know, the country that my, uh, the land area that my parents were born in, North Korea, is one of them. But there are very few countries who can live outside it. And so our role is to make sure that even the poorest countries are able to live inside the global market uh, in, uh, in, in as productive and effective a way for them as possible. So, for example, we do things like, for central bankers here, uh, we have something called the Reserve Asset Management Program, where, uh, you know, in many countries in Africa, for example, um, uh, one of the very important things we did was we separated central banks from ministries of finance, just like you have here. 
And the reason you do that is that you don't want central banks to be run on the basis of a particular uh, government's policy. You want them to think independently about, um, about uh, stability. And so we found that these central banks that we'd helped get started had these assets, and they were quite literally keeping them under the mattress. They were like literally keeping them in a safe, earning no uh, uh, interest at all. So we have a program that goes in and tries to help them manage their money. And last year, I think we uh, increased the overall assets of uh, central banks by over a billion dollars. So it's not so much, you know, there's not a country in the world that can avoid dealing with global market capitalism. There's not a country in the world that can do that. And so our job is to help countries insert themselves in that system as effectively as possible for them. That's what we do. That, that's, that's a big part of my job. It's what we'll continue to do. Uh, is that time is up? To you. Thank you. President, President Kim, this was uh, a fascinating morning for us. Uh, I think anybody in this room uh, who has not thought about all the complications of this complex world, I think have a new perspective uh, thanks to your presentation and also to your answers uh, to quite a number of important questions. So also on behalf of the Bundesbank, uh, I would like to thank you very much for this visit. So I hope you enjoyed uh, the audience, you enjoyed our campus, and you might consider in the future to come again. Uh, I, th <laughs> thank you. Uh, I would love to come back again. I'll have to search for more Goethe quotes before I come back again. But let me just say one thing. You know, for the students in this, in this room, um, uh, you know, like the last uh, questioner, I, I think it's so important for you to continue to ask really, really hard questions of me and of everyone else uh, who is involved in, in um, uh, affairs of the global economy because we don't always get it right. There's blind spots that we have. And uh, continue to study, continue to ask questions, and continue to ask the most basic questions about why is it this way. Uh, and you never know. Um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe the next, um, uh, or the, one of the, f the future presidents of the World Bank is uh, sitting right here with us. Keep critiquing, keep asking questions. Uh, you know, you would be surprised at how much people like me listen to those critiques out in the world. We do. We do, because we're, 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 we know that we have this sacred mission of ending extreme poverty and boosting shared prosperity, and we know we can't do it without the involvement of, uh, of, of people like everyone in this room. Thank you very much. <laughs>